Hey, hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or good night, depending on your time zone. Uh, my name is Nico Dekens, also known as Dutch Ocean Guy Online. For those who can perform a little bit of ocean, you may be able to find me on that moniker. Uh, I have a background in uh, over two decades within law enforcement. Then I stepped out of law enforcement and starting to conduct open source intelligence as a let's say a civilian. Uh, and I started instructing for SANS, teaching the SANS SEC 487 course that my great friend, Michael Hoffman, who will introduce himself in just a moment, uh, offered. And I co-offered the SANS SEC 537 Open Source Intelligence, Practical Open Source Intelligence Gathering Analysis course. And we are about to uh, deliver the SANS 5. Uh, sec 87 587 advanced open source intelligence a really mouthful but today we are here to talk about open source intelligence and conducting open source intelligence investigations under gdpr within the eu but before we do that let micah hoffman introduce himself <laughs> man you are highly caffeinated this is great hey uh, everybody i'm micah uh michael hoffman i go by web breacher on twitter and most social media as nico mentioned i am uh, uh heavily involved in the open source intelligence community i'm an instructor and an author here at sans i also am the president of the osin curious project which uh i think nico and i will be talking about a little bit later on and just um i'm thrilled to be here with you nico yeah yeah thank you so yeah um it was a topic that was long asked for by a lot of people uh especially since things changed due to gdpr particularly for me being in the in the eu um probably you well don't have to cope with that that much but that makes it interesting for this discussion because now we have at least people in two different time zones coming from different jurisdictions that well, both do open source intelligence investigations, but have some issues. So uh, before we get into it, I want to make very clear that uh, neither Micah or myself are lawyers. So uh, we um, highly suggest if you are going to conduct open source intelligence investigations, please uh, contact your own legal team or someone that knows a little bit more about GDPR than we do. We can only tell based upon our personal practice and experience what we know from GDPR and references. So making sure that we got that cleared. Also, we've got um, everything that we're going to discuss today. We've got a short summary of URLs uh, that uh, we can share with you, which is uh, to be found at im.osincurio.us forward slash GDPR, which you can now see up on your slide and probably will be as a banner a couple of more times. So for those who forget, im.osincurio.us forward slash GDPR. So, um, well, I think it's just, fairly straight to get just right in it. Um, my question immediately would be, uh, Micah, so since you are in the US, did uh, GDPR impact you at all? Yeah, and before we get into before we get into that, it might be good for us just to talk about what those uh, GDPR, what the GDPR is, um, yeah. and and what it seeks to do, and and what it actually did as far as hampering or uh, not interfering, but but getting in the way of some of our investigations. Do you want to just briefly describe what it is for our audience, just in case yeah. people don't know? So uh, for those who do not know, uh, in May 2018, GDPR uh, officially was uh, uh, instated, um, which basically means that they released a, a regulation where um, you as a citizen within the EU now all in the sun have all kinds of rights, all concerning your privacy. So uh, after that moment, basically uh, GDPR prohibits any civilian to collect information about you uh, unless they stick to a certain uh, set of rules. That's long story short, which means that if, if you want to um, collect information or process data about an individual, you need to have a legal base for processing that data. You need to ha understand that there are certain pr principles, if you are going to do that, that you need to stick to. And basically, you need to uh, figure out who will store that data. And if they store it, how long and, and how well protected that data will be. So that's a really short version of GDPR because you got to know it's over 99 uh, articles, which we just made a really bad joke about uh, prior to we uh, starting. There's a song is 99 problems, but GDPR ain't none. Um, but that's uh, that's something that makes it immediately really hard. There are so many articles in there with, uh, well, 
I think we all know when it comes to rules and regulations, you, someone can always interpret something in between the lines. Yeah. And that makes it so hard. So well, coming it, back to my main question, uh, the yeah, GDPR, uh, did it impact you? Yeah, it actually did. Uh, for those of us that are not um, protected by the general data protection regulations over in the EU, um, we had some impact because a lot of the data that we might have been harvesting from from different locations, classically places like social media and other places like maybe the who is system for the registration of of domains started masking or not providing the information that we previously had had received so um the impact to me was i had to work a little bit harder to to gain some of that data and you know in some places i just couldn't do it anymore um but again my a lot of my targets, my the people that I'm doing open source intelligence on, were not EU citizens. I was doing things uh, uh, in the United States, in Asia. So the people that I'm researching were not protected by GDPR. But you, I think, had some different experiences because, well, you're not only subject to the, the regulations yourself because you're an EU citizen, but some of your targets that you were investigating, both law enforcement and non-law enforcement, um, were in the EU as well. You want to share yeah. some of that? Yeah, well, first of all, I, I found it really interesting to see that when I was in law enforcement, I had uh, also rules and regulations, but um, it's good to know for the audience, for instance, that most law enforcement agencies and, for instance, journalism have some kind of uh, uh, different freedom that they don't necessarily need to uh, keep in mind GDPR, but they will have their own rules and regulations to still be able to collect data, but still should also uh, use that data very responsibly and cannot get it without, for instance, prosecution office, uh, that kind of information. And that for me um, was interesting to see because now all of a sudden with me being a civilian, I was able to get the information uh, faster when I was outside of uh, the government, because within the government, those rules and regulations are so slow. Okay. And, and it's more the bureaucracy that we had to deal with, uh, which is a good thing, but for open source intelligence, sometimes it's a bad thing because the internet is a pretty um, fluid and quick system where you need to pull information almost immediately when possible yeah, and that like makes a it also or a riot or somebody's gone yeah. thing or something's happening right now breaking events a couple of yeah. days to get a lawyer or legal counsel to approve your request to collect information about the yellow shirts um that that can be very uh delaying for your for your investigation yeah and now i may have from my consultancy company i sometimes get almost similar cases from clients where uh, I can still do the same things under GDPR regulations, uh, which give me a little bit more flexibility. I can, I can, for instance, uh, move quicker into certain semi-closed groups because if, let's say, there's a group uh, on Telegram or on Facebook or whatever where I need to, under my virtual identity or, or virtual agent account, of sock puppet, whatever you like to call it, I need to move in there to get an understanding of what's going on or maybe what kind of demonstrations or rallies they are planning because it can impact, for instance, a company that's hiring their brand or reputation or whatever so normally it would take at least two weeks for me to get uh, um, written mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> at least <laughs> that was the normal process or well in certain quick cases 84 to 84 hours but still that's too long and now with gdpr now my client beforehand we would do that proper intake saying hey what's in scope what's out scope uh, keeping GDPR regulations in our mind. And with that, I can now move forward. And which means I could position myself in those groups. And as long as I don't target the individuals, so not trying to identify them as, for instance, being Micah Hoffman. So if it's only someone with a certain moniker or alias, it's pretty hard for me to say, hey, now I am collecting personal individual data, unless okay. I can deliberately tie it to a individual from which I know it's, for instance, it's social security number or given birth date, what really ties it to you. So for your investigations, when you have a, a target or something, I think one of the things that might be interesting is you might be collecting data about a person, about a group on a certain platform. Um, at some time, do you look at this and, and say, you know what? 
these people I have now identified um, are EU citizens. So now I need to do some things a little different in my investigation. Or do you usually go in when you're scoping your, your investigations? Hey, am I going to come in contact with EU citizens? And if so, then all of my investigation will be a certain way. Do you, you see what I'm saying? Is does does GDPR change your investigation midstream, or do you kind of set the boundaries? This is going to be a GDPR um, influenced investigation, so I need to take some different uh, processes. Does, uh, honestly, I, I always keep in mind the GDPR regulations because you never know when you move around and pivot around during your investigation where you end up. You may end up on, uh, let's say, a French server, or you may end up in a social media platform, or at least an, a U.S. Uh, social media platform, but the users that you're investigating are EU citizens. So I always keep that in mind. But with that, that immediately implies that I need to talk with my client. Hey, so if I am collecting data in what form, either automated or manually, I should at least be able to collect everything because if I cannot collect everything during my collection process uh, before I start actually processing and exploiting the data and analyzing it and making an intelligence product of it, uh, sometimes you simply don't know if a piece of information means something within your investigation. Yeah. And, and that is pre when you literally look at some articles within GDPR, they basically say you can only collect the data that's needed for your research question. Which you can you can pick nothing more than you actually actually need. Right. So that makes it so challenging and so hard sometimes because if I was tasked, for instance, to investigate if you visited, let's say, uh, Amsterdam, uh, I would not immediately know where to look. First of all, I needed to find you online, and with that, um, assuming you're an EU citizen, right? So. With that, now I need to look at it. But sometimes you, for instance, would need to download all the pictures you ever uploaded because uh, if you don't geotag them with X and Y coordinates or deliberately describe underneath them where it is, I would need to do image analysis on sure. it. So and GDPR, take time. So, G, so first off, GDPR focuses on EU citizens, not EU businesses, which is something that I was under a misperception of earlier on in, in when they were first being, uh, in, uh, well, enforced in 2018. So it's only about the citizens. And so what you're telling me is that the GDPR um, asks you to limit your scope to only collect the data that you need to answer whatever research question, legal question, or whatever you've been tasked to do. But in OSINT, how many times have you got collected all of the things and then at the end realized that some things that you'd collected along the way were were important and you didn't even realize it? If, if we were in an investigation where we're only collecting targeted information, we might be discarding some of that other data that we think is not, not necessarily relevant before the end of our assessment. So when you do your investigations uh, within the scope of a GDR investigation, are you collecting all of the things that you normally would? And then at the end of the investigation, deciding, you know what, I don't need this, I don't need that, and, and essentially deleting, removing that and pruning the data back to just what you need? Is that how you work? It really depends on uh, the goal and scope of the client because sometimes they will need to take it to court, for instance, okay. and they would need to have full transparency. In, uh, for example, if uh, the the lawyers from the other end of the line want to have cl things cleared up, so if I prune everything, um, well, information would be gone. So. In those cases, I would store and collect everything, but I would only share within my final report the required data hmm. and information. But I would, for instance, store to a certain amount of time until, for instance, that court case was closed, that data, because they may ask for it. And that's just uh, being transparent, because that's right. something that, that GDPR also asks from you. Hey, you need to be able to show um, someone the information you collected from or about them right where the sources are yeah and i guess that's one of the in more interesting things about about this is that uh and and why i love the fact that you started off saying hey we're not lawyers here you need to figure this out yourself within the scope of your investigations and your companies because uh each eu member state our member country has uh, a different 
um, a different uh, EU, uh, a different GDPR implementation. So within France, within Belgium and Netherlands, whatever, um, you need to know those specific laws that that pertain to you. So, um, yeah, if if you're going to court, um, that's going to be a, a ch more challenging type of issue. But uh, one of the things that I think we talked about, you and I talked about pre before we got on the air, was that GDPR has special exceptions if you are working as law enforcement and if you are working as a private citizen just doing normal personal things so like if i wanted to look up an ex-girlfriend or boyfriend or or college friend or something like that and they are an eu citizen that information is not necessarily protected under gdpr but if i have a company and i'm researching a person or people then their data would be protected. Is that also kind of right? Yeah, I think you may be referring it as to being a, a commercial investigation that, that you're gaining profit from it either way, either financially or building your business or, or gaining more um, uh, recognition. Those things, just maybe your neighbor investigating someone that they did something that's a tin and makes sense, right? Because that would basically limit people going online and finding stuff. Yeah, and that could never be. Uh, and also, what I think it's good to know that um, I think the the fundamentals of GDPR are what a lot of people don't know are also closely tied to those EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. They have Article Eight that says the protection of personal data. So basically, that entire article says you, basically everyone, has the right to the protection of their personal data concerning him or her. That's that's something that just within the EU, uh, Jay just tell you. Even though that you may share information almost everywhere on the on the internet, which is openly or freely available, because that's our work basically, uh, Micah's work and my work. Uh, but once we start collecting and aggregating the data and 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 analyzing the data, it's not that scattered pieces anymore. It becomes an intelligence product, and with that, that. Now GDPR comes in, comes into play and saying, "Hey, now you're doing something with all that data, basically uh, drawing an entire picture of someone, which always has to be an individual and not a business." Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I guess one of my questions, actually, one of the things that we should point out uh, at the beginning of the uh, the the live stream today, you mentioned the I am .us slash GDPR short URL. And that yep. takes people to a blog post that you made on yep. Oats and Curious's website. And one of the things on there is a great blog by our friends, uh, Matthias Wilson and yeah. uh, Ludo, Ludo Block. Block. Now they have, uh, they've gone through, uh, Ludo has gone through and Matthias as well, uh, have gone through the GDPR and, and really uh, pulled apart some of the things that are specifically pertaining to the OSINT field. So um, that blog in and of it, it, there's other blog posts up there as well, including one for the OSINT Curious project that, that we've made and many other ones that we're going to be bringing up throughout today. Um, so I guess one of the things that I, I noticed in Matthias and Ludo's blog is that they have a really nice summary in there. And this is from 2019. So that was that was two years ago, and and I'm sure that there has been some clarification and some other um, some other work that's out there as well. But um, you know, you mentioned that there's four things that you need a legal basis for yeah. processing personal data. You have to apply principles uh, when you're processing people's personal data. The data subject has certain specific rights. and you need to understand if you're the data controller or the data processor. Now, Let's focus on one of those if we can, the certain principles of processing data. So when I have my normal process when I'm investigating Nico Dakins over in the Netherlands, um, how does that change if I know Nico Dakins is in a in a, a, a country that is under GDPR? What other things do I need to know about how I'm collecting and storing that data about Nico? 
Well, I think it 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 immediately ties back to what we also what we earlier referred to is to uh, difference, for instance, by uh, collecting data manually uh, um, compared to an automated system. So there are OSINT tools out there that are able to pull almost everything by one click. You just, you just provided the username, and for instance, if I was interested in everything uh, that you have posted on Facebook, I could just click it and it pulls everything. But then, but then when we look back at uh, GDPR, it says, hey, you can only collect the data that you actually need for that specific task. And that then ties into those principles. So I need to first take a step back before I maybe ac actually be firing up my laptop or desktop and start investigating and saying, hey, what do I actually need? Okay. And what am I going to use to achieve those goals? Do I, can I do it with uh, tools that are limited that will give me the information that I need, or do I specifically collect everything and be transparent and filter out only that part that I need? But I need to be transparent at all times. So you need to describe at all times, for instance, in your final report, or it has to be clear if someone asks questions, in essence, uh, that you have that that principle and the, the way you... Now, well, basically, it's your methodology. Okay. It has to be clear under GDPR regulations. And what about the data protection? So um, I have, you know, encrypted drives. I do other things. Are there certain special things that that we should be doing with GDPR data or data of EU citizens, personal data of EU citizens, to ensure that we are protecting it as best as we can from from uh, accidental disclosure and other types of of people seeing it? Yeah, well, that's a good question because uh, that can be, again, pretty challenging. For instance, if you fire up your Chrome or Firefox browser and you start browsing and you start figuring out information about a person, basically you're collecting all kinds of data and the data gets stored within your browser. There may be a plausible reason for you and your client to say, hey, after every time you've browsed for a couple of hours, now you need to delete your entire browser history and all the content and basically uh, set up a clean machine. But with that, if you delete that, now you can never be fully transparent again if you, for instance, need to show up in court. So again, it's that balance on, hey, what do we collect? And if we do it, how long do we store it? Um, when I look at my personal uh, practical use cases, I think nine out of the 10 cases will say, hey, uh, during this investigation, you can collect everything. Uh, once you start processing and analyzing, you need to make sure that the information that ends up in your final report is only the information that is in scope. And everything that you collected needs to be encrypted and cannot be accessed by anyone besides you and your client. Okay. Which means uh, I would normally encrypt it on, let's say, a Ver VeraCrypt container uh, on a separate uh, uh, encrypted hard drive. And that I, for instance, would store either in a vault uh, at my client or a vault that I have access to, a physical vault, meaning. And keep in mind, and that's something that a lot of people that I personally know sometimes will often forget, you can only store that data uh, no longer than is needed when you look at GDPR regulations. And that, for me, is always the most mysterious part because no longer than is needed. Yeah, yeah. What, 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 what does that mean? Because even though something went up into court and court was closed, there may very well be something that pops up, let's say, half a year or a year or two years later, that you still now need access to the data again. But if it's wiped, now it's gone. That's something so that I can't get my head around. So, so uh, here we're talking about data retention policies, and um, I know in Sec Forty Seven we 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 talk about your organization what, or you if you're doing this by yourself need to figure out what your company or your your personal data retention policies are for the work that you do because. I have some friends, some colleagues in the OSINT world that when they deliver that final report, they will delete all of the records, all of the notes that they have. And that final report is everything. And then I have other people that are going to court and they have to preserve the whole VM with all of the data that's in there for, like you said, you know, months or years. But I think that the important thing here is 
is in the interpretation of you need to protect the data, right? This is not going to be on some, some shared public server. No, nope. you can't just take some <laughs> EU citizens, private personal data and use it as an example on some public blog. Those are absolute violations. And I guess one of the other things that I want to bring up is Art's uh, question from LinkedIn. Uh, Art writes, uh, is there a violation against GDPR if someone conducts a security assessment using OSINT? How would they track it if a researcher uses a VPN? I guess the question here, Nico, is if I'm over here in the United States and I'm VPNing into the EU, maybe Poland or, or Netherlands, or whatever, and I'm doing my work, Am I at risk of getting have having a GDPR violation lodged against me? How will they figure out it's me? Will I get fined? What is yeah. the enforcement look like of this? Yeah, that really depends country by country within the, within the EU, EU. And what I've seen the last year since it was uh, started GDPR, they will only until now go off to go after those large or larger companies and okay. and they ba and basically what they what they do they will they would factually not look into uh the investigations themselves but they would more look like for instance at their clientele so let's say you have a large fortune 500 company within the eu and okay. they have um, um client data so you si sign up for an insurance, I don't know, whatever, and you give your credentials. So basically private data. So now they will look for that information if they store and collect and process that data um, uh, by keeping in mind those GDPR regulations. I've never heard of, uh, let's say, a PI a bureau or uh, another investigative bureau being uh, investigated by the authorities for not sticking to GDPR regulations. Yeah, you know, I, I'm trying to make uh, to think of this in like an analogy, and I'm thinking uh, it, it's kind of like speeding in your car. You know, the speed limit in, on a road might be 120 kilometers per hour or something like that, and you can go faster. And as long as nobody's around and going to report you, and as long as you don't do anything heinous, anything bad, like getting in an accident or or something else you'll probably get away with it no problem but speeding 100 over 120 kilometers an hour when you're driving by a police station might not be a good thing because people are more likely to notice that you're doing that i don't think i agree with you that the enforcement that i've seen of this has been on those large multinational companies that are collecting large amounts of data either through mobile apps phone operating systems or other things like telecoms and all and they're the ones that I guess are easier targets for somebody to recognize that I, Michael Hoffman, have VPNed into, or maybe not even VPN, have just collected EU citizen data would be very challenging for them to map that back to me. It's going to be much easier for them to look at those large groups or large corporations that they know are collecting this data and possibly not abiding by the GDPR. Would you yeah. agree with that? Yeah, yes, absolutely. But honestly, but I would always make sure that you stick to those rules because yep. when they check you out, those fines are no joke, uh, uh, really. And it could also really damage your, your company's reputation if, you don't, if you're not sticking to the rules and regulations. It's just good ethics also. Um, also, I always like to think of it, hey, what if it was someone who was investigating me? Uh, uh, there's nothing wrong if people wanted to investigate me, but I would be very reassured if someone at least stick to all the rules that we need to play by when we are doing these things. Yeah. Yeah. And well, that's also, that's also something that I always find funny when I look at GDPR because GDPR describes consent of the person who need, who is investigated, which. Yeah. How does that actually work within a notion investigation? Yeah. Well, not, uh, or at least in, in, in 99 of the cases, it, it will not work because it would not make sense. For instance, if someone asked me, hey, uh, a, a consultancy company, we want you because I have a background in law enforcement. I know a little bit about counterterrorism and they want me to investigate certain individuals that they may think are related to that stuff. So would make no sense for me to do my investigation, close off my investigation and send them an email. Hey, I'm that chosen guy. I just performed an open source intelligence assessment upon you based upon counterterrorism. Now, you know, if you want to know more, please email me. It That's right. just I'll doesn't make sense. Data per yeah. data. Well, you know, if we look at the intent behind it, and again, we are not lawyers, 
But if you look at, but I'm going to go ahead and pretend to be one. <laughs> if you look at the intent behind the GDPR, it looks like it's made to prevent large corporations from collecting massive amounts of, of private data and then yeah. using it for some reason without the EU citizens opting in. Now, the specific ex exceptions that are granted uh, kind of highlight that. Hey, this is we're not talking about private citizens doing that. We're not talking about law enforcement doing this. We're talking about companies. Now, companies collecting personal data. And you doing this in support of a legal basis kind of um, uh, is not the intent behind the, the GDPR. But like you said, we as investigators absolutely need to stay cognizant of those regulations and in line with them, especially if we are going to court. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, so maybe it will be interesting for people to know that once GDPR started, basically we started to get some sort of blind spots within our open source intelligence tools and techniques that we use. Um, but we can sometimes still find information that is uh, pre-GDPR, for instance. So we could, for instance, go to, um, uh, when we look at domain information, go to tools like uh, Woxy or Domain Big Data and be able to pull up uh, a registrant's name for a domain or a phone number or an email address that we may need to pivot into other places of the internet based upon all their data. There's, of course, there's a risk with that because you're now collecting outdated data in essence, which could contain false positives. But hey, that's what we do within open source intelligence. We collect data and then we fact check that data for uh, its its trustworthiness. So we try right. to find that data in other sources to confirm that that's still uh, factual. So there yeah. are still ways. Well, and that was one of the biggest concerns uh, back in 2018 when uh, the GDPR regulations went into enforcement was we saw the who is registration system kind of mask a lot of the data that we previously had had access to and it really hampered a lot of people that were doing research into those pop-up domains that were being used for phishing or yeah. malware hosting now they could no longer see even the false data that was being input into the who is system um but one of the things I love about the OSINT investigators that I know, they have that that investigative spirit that when there's one resource that's no longer giving them the information they need, they they search for other resources. And that's what we did. You know, when when going to who is no longer gave us the administration um, point of content and the technical points of contact for a certain domain, we used historical data. We also could go to other places that didn't care about GDPR. And this is an interesting point, Nika. Yeah. Um, are you finding that some resources out there that host EU citizen data just don't seem to care about GDPR? They're still hosting and sharing that data in, in I guess, in violation of GDPR. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm noticing um, uh, even uh, official red registrars, uh, regional registrars doing that, sharing that. Apnic, Lacnic, they would have some um, some original content being available, um, but also um, smaller companies will just have. Um, maybe not enough technical personnel to pull down all that information from their web website, for instance, that that may contain those, uh, well, now considered to be GDPR violations. For instance, you will see a lot of schools, uh, elementary schools, high schools, universities, uh, sharing photos of students that are no longer allowed to be shared without consent. Uh, you will see uh, local sporting clubs, so tennis clubs, soccer clubs, rugby clubs, whatever, having those Excel spreadsheets online containing first name, last name, phone number, address, and so on. And officially, that information within the EU can no longer be online unless people deliberately say, hey, you can share that information to the public. Uh, and that's something that, that still gives, I think, uh, I think us from an open source intelligence perspective a little advantage so if we know how to move around on the internet and maybe craft our google searches using google operators we can often still pull that information uh, but the next step would be hey did i now legally collect that data because yeah. officially it cannot be there and that's always that 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 balance where i 
when in doubt, I immediately consult legal because uh, hey, it may be very possible for me to find that information doesn't mean that I can use or analyze that information at all times. And that's something that, that makes it for us, I think, hard sometimes to, uh, to collect data. Is that, that's easy, but actually start to use the data in a proper way. That's hard, and and I I think honestly you cannot always expect from every OSINT uh, investigator to know every piece of law from every country within the EU, let's say, of the world, and that makes it so hard with all these rules and regulations. Yeah, and and uh, I think that's a, a very important piece that many times we in uh, when we're doing these SANS live streams or when we're doing OSINT curious live streams, we don't talk about the business behind our business that. You know, I have a lawyer that I talk to, uh, you know, every month at least on different issues. And I know that you have legal counsel as well. Um, it's not one of those flashy things. It's just one of those support people that helps us stay legal in what we do. And that's another thing that was brought up in, I think, uh, Ludo and Matthias's blog post the lawfulness of the collection. That's one of the principles of the GDPR is that. I should not be hacking or cracking or doing illegally obtaining this information. So even if I, um, well, that, that's, that kind of helps me understand what data can and cannot be collected. There are some gray areas though, right? Like breach data. If somebody steals some internal, uh, some documents about a person and they have names and addresses and phone numbers and other bits of, of identity, uh, personally identifiable information about EU citizens and releases that. Now I collect that, or maybe I steal that from someplace. Um, then uh, we have some issues as well. So yeah. we, the collection needs to be lawful. Yeah. It immediately bring, uh, when you gave that reference, uh, it, it, it popped up an example. I, I, I once had a case where I needed to investigate an individual when GDPR was just uh, enforced. And actually I found someone's social media profile, but then that specific lawyer of that client said, Hey, so now you found the information that we are looking for. Uh, but how am I now 100% confident that that's actually an account operated by that individual and that information is factually true and i'm i'm like well you know it's the internet yeah, I, I i i cannot tell you who operates that account who logs in every day on that let's say twitter account or facebook account and who actually posts that information and if what they post is factually true and could be tied back to that uh, individual so with that that lawyer said so there's no problem we can get we can grab that data because it's posted online openly available with in this case the consent of the operator of that account and for us it's impossible at this time to determine who operated that account when that specific post was made and i'm like yeah, yeah from that perspective let i understand you. Yeah. yeah that's let, let the lawyers be lawyers and i'm like yeah. but but that makes it that that what makes it so complex so you can find so much information but when you look at these 99 articles with every article you can almost interpret them in five or six different ways especially when it comes to collecting and storing and processing the data because it all depends on what is the goal where did you find the information and it, it makes it so hard yeah uh, one of our our viewers over on youtube ludovic plur um, asked a question here about how do gdpr policies uh how are gdpr policies controlled or monitored in both technical and legal aspects in order to be gdpr compliant so um, what I, I'm not sure if this is, it says by cert EU or EU cyber stakeholders. So I'm not, I'm pretty sure that the cert EU and EU cyber stakeholders are not, not looking for people like you and me that are doing our best to abide by the GDPR rules, following those principles and, and really trying to protect the data that that's there. I have a feeling that they're more looking at the larger organizations that are uh, those data brokers that are buying and selling huge amounts of data or data breaches, right? Where we have yeah. personal information in there. Um, do you have any thoughts on that, Nico? Well, I recently had a, had a very long conversation with a person who is a recruiter 
And most recruiters online rely on targeting people. But to target people, they need large amounts of data, personal data. So phone numbers, email addresses, and that's so I basically asked them, how does GDPR work for you? And they were literally saying to me, hey, uh, no one uh, ever was uh, fine for it. So we right. are doing what we are doing, which for me meant, hey, so there's an entire industry beside my industry who was, who was basically performing open source intelligence techniques, collecting data, processing data. So, so you have people uh, doing advertisements online, targeted advertisements. You have people uh, trying to recruit people. You have all kinds of people who are using open source intelligence kind of technique, collecting data, processing data on a huge scale yeah. with very personal detailed information, but actually not doing anything yeah. with gdpr well it's interesting that that you, you that this person or gave you the impression that they are above gdpr because well we're not doing all the things but they are absolutely you know collecting storing and processing personally identifiable information of eu citizens now they have a good reason for doing that and it's it's an important thing that they're doing filling jobs but how many times have people reached out to you nico and said hey I have a job for you. Just click here or, hey, you know, you'd be great for this. And you get more spam information. I guess, you know, we have the ability to opt out if we know that our our information's in there. But um, that's a very good point that that there are huge industries that are based upon the collection and processing of PII um, for certain reasons. Yeah, and there's, this, of course, there's some sort of consent because a lot of applications, for instance, we install on our uh, mobile devices, we will see those large pop-ups when we just install them saying, hey, do you uh, agree with us collecting and storing this information and basically selling that information because no one on average reads it. So we actually, I think very often, just gave permission to share that data with others. So they may have legally obtained that information. Yeah, because so, I've okay. noticed when I travel to the U.S., I installed an application and I played. I played with it. That was just just before the pandemic started. I was over in the states for the Ocean Summit, and I, I installed an application, and I didn't get those pop-ups. Yeah, and I moved over. Uh, of course, after a week or so, I was back in in Amsterdam, and I installed that same application again, and now I got those pop-ups. Which for right. me meant at least the application builder has knows based probably upon my IP address that I'm installing something in a different region in the world. Right, and that you might be sub that your data then might be subject to GDPR pri yep. uh, privacy. Yep. Um, so let me ask you this: I was thinking about this when you were talking about social media exploitation. You know, when you are looking at somebody's Facebook, uh, that an EU citizen's Facebook, or maybe even not an EU citizen, but you're looking for information about this person, maybe on VK or some other social media platform. Sometimes, like in uh, in public places your face your image the fact that you and i are sitting down at a cafe somewhere might be captured when some tourist takes a picture of the fountain in front of our cafe now my image and your image are in that person's social media and on some platforms you can do like image searching and see oh show me all the pictures where micah or nico are in and i wonder that person that's taking the picture probably doesn't have to get our permission because they're not um, they're there. This is for private use, but the platform that they upload it to, would they be subject to something because they are now storing and processing my information without my consent? I honestly wouldn't know. I think okay. uh, my, my gut feeling would say it has to do with intention. So okay. in this case, the, the uploader did not have the intention to violate your privacy. Okay. They were just taking a selfie and you passed by in the background, which sometimes happened, and they uploaded to their, their timeline somewhere, and now your face is on the internet. Yeah. Um, the, naturally, for me, it, 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 there was no intention to expose you. And again, that's that's basically uh, what still gives us the advantage because we can use techniques like reverse image searching or uh, image analysis to to find that information that now 
officially we cannot find, but still we can find because now someone else uploads something about you without your official consent, but still the intention was never there to uh, violate your privacy. So has this changed the examples that you use in class or in blog posts or in other places that you give when you talk about, hey, we can find this data or that data? Do you do you now choose not to use EU citizen information in your in your teaching, in your blog post because it can be more complicated? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, for instance, I, I have a talk where I talk about the fundamentals and basics on OSINT that I get asked to do very often, uh, especially when we're doing this in public, in venues, I would have that entire section deliberately say, hey, no one can take pictures of this section because it contains someone's private details. Uh, they have given me, in this case, they have given me consent to show it to you within this audience but it's not meant to be on the public in the public sphere yeah. on the internet anymore. So that that made it, or at least it made me more aware of making absolutely sure that I will not share that information. Or if I need to, I need to redact or blur or whatever I need to do. Yeah. Well, in your SEC 587 class that's coming out later this fall, you have a whole module on there where you teach about hate groups investigating. <laughs> 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 something dropped out of the sky <laughs> oh there we go there's yeah. a card um so you you have a whole module in there talking about hate groups and researching hate groups and i'm wondering i haven't seen this i'm looking forward to taking your 587 class later on this year but do you have any disclaimers or any or are the subjects of the that of those slides that in examples that you're using are they non-eu people or Yep, they're you... all they're all non-EU. Just to make sure that I wasn't violating anything. So every picture you will see in those examples are non-EU, or at least as far as I know, because that's sometimes the problem. Sometimes uh, yeah. you have a picture, let's say, of a demonstration or a rally somewhere, and just by looking at that picture, uh, I have no way of telling of each and every individual in there are either from the EU or not. Right. So, but we made, I think, we made ninety-nine come a nine percent sure that we are not violating gdpr within the course content but yeah that's something that we deliberately or at least i in this in this case for that module deliberately thought about hey i want to show people how to investigate sensitive or hate groups or whatever you like to call them and then what kind of methodology you need to need to use or can use but i also but that's something that i think uh, even before gdpr was there i always found important that you should always try and respect someone's privacy at all times, even though it may be a suspect, even though we are, everybody has a right to privacy. Uh, right. That's something that I think is really important. Yeah. Not here in the United States. Well, you have privacy, but it's a little bit different. <laughs> You're going to be coming over there to live in the EU in a little while. Um, one more thing that I wanted to bring up before, I know we're getting close on time, but one thing I wanted to mention uh, was in those principles, when you're collecting the data of an EU person, um, there's also a, a principle of accuracy where, uh, I mean, you mentioned it earlier, people lie on social media, people, there's false data or wrong data that's out there. Um, we as the data collectors are, it's important for us to make sure that we verify and validate the data that's out there about EU citizens um, to make sure that it is technically accurate. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah, absolutely. So um, um, what I would like to do within, within my uh, methodology is if I fi find a piece of data about an individual, so let's say I find their home address as an example, I would want to uh, at least take the effort to try and find that, that piece of information or confirm that in at least one other, preferably two or three other sources, just to make sure that it's accurate before I actually start using it. Because now I can somewhat prove and even all those other sources that I find may uh, also have been uh, false trails or whatever planted information. But at least now I have four pieces, four, four different sources claiming to be say, hey, this is the address of Micah Hoffman. So that's something that I have in my methodology, never trust on one source when you yeah. find information. And if you do so, then deliberately describe, hey, this is one source. I took these and these and these steps to try and verify it, wasn't able to do it. So maybe take this with 10 grains of salt. Yeah. 
Well, I'm thinking about all of the things that we've talked about in the last hour and how really it starts off with a methodology. And you and I have talked about this many times on Ocean Curious and in other places that having that methodology, having that process for this is how I'm and not just how I'm going to go and collect data from Facebook. That's the easy part. But this is where I'm storing my data. This is how I'm going to be processing my data. This is what I'm going to do to redact the data and to, to sort through the data. Having that is important in a regular OSINT investigation. And the addition of the GDPR privacy uh, rules to that, uh, just really tweak it a little bit to, to make us focus even more on, do you really have what you need? Do you have too much but we're still protecting the data. We're still encrypting the data. We're still verifying and validating the data. It's just when you have a target over in the EU, from an OSINT perspective, we do some things a little bit more deeply um, to protect that data. Yeah, and the problem can be now that some data may be redacted by default or is gone by default, and we need to rely on archives or older data to still find that data. But that's just what open source intelligence analysts or investigators do. They use all the tools within their toolbox to find the information. Yep. So sometimes I cannot find, let's say, uh, contact details on someone's about page anymore due to GDPR, but I am able to find that those details in archive.org or archive.is that has a cached copy of that page from pre-GDPR. So. Yeah, that yeah. are just those niche techniques that we use. Well, and, and I think that that brings up an excellent point that sometimes our creativity as investigators come into play. For instance, when the who is data got masked and we it was more challenging for us to find current um, current data that showed who owned what domains. We started thinking about what are the other things that can tie domains together, whether it's Google Analytics or other analytics codes or things like HTTPS certificates, right? We can go to census.io or some of the other places, look in there and see what companies or organizations or even people have put in their email addresses, IPs and other things um, to, to maybe tie different domains together. Yes, we're not getting name, address, phone number, email for private EU citizens sometimes, but there are HTTPS certificates and other bits of data that we can collect as investigators that can contain that. So sometimes we just need to be a little bit more creative instead of thinking, well, this is my main source. And I know that you and I have, have talked many times about not just focusing on one tool or, or, or a set of tools, but to keep you, the field of investigation as open as you can. Yeah, absolutely. It's always about exhausting your resources and, and, and having that methodology. And I think, especially with GDPR, if you have that really clear one research question, you will, you will, that may, may basically mandate you to only collect that data that is for that focuses. specific research question. It really yeah, focuses, focuses you. you. Yeah. That's great. And I, I think that's a, a very important point here is, is that you should only collect the data that you need and nothing more when you're yeah. dealing with specifically an EU. Thing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think looking at what we discussed, we covered basically everything that, that has to do with GDPR and as well. Of course, we could probably <laughs> spend another week talking about every article in GDPR. But I think now looking at the questions coming from the audience, thank you for all those questions and all those, those suggestions um, that some of you may have learned some new things about GDPR. Some of you may have learned some new resources by looking at that short URL. Uh, but I think overall, when we look back at uh, this past almost hour, that the important part for you is as an investigator that you should always be aware when it comes to EU citizens, so individuals, not businesses, be aware of what you collect. And you can only collect that data that you actually need for that specific investigation. And you need to make sure that what you collect, that you process and store that in uh, in such a way that it's uh, uh, safe uh, and no longer than needed. Yeah. So that basically sums up GDPR well, roughly. Well, and going back to my speeding in a car analogy, because I, I kind of like that. Um, <laughs> you know, if, if I'm speeding in a car and nobody's around taking note of that, 
you know, I'm going to get away with it. If I speed in a car and video myself doing that and post that to my Instagrams and my other places, then that's going to be more noticed and I may get in trouble. So for those of you that are making blog posts that are doing public types of publications, make sure that if you have EU or anybody's data in them, um, EU uh, citizen data or anybody's data in them, mask that stuff unless it's extremely important that that person be tied to a certain thing. Um, and I'll, I'll point out this resource one more time. I am .us slash GDPR. That's a short URL that will take you to the OSINT Curious webpage that has a list of links that Nico has curated. Um, and it actually has a link to the recording of this live stream. Nico, yeah, thanks absolutely. for having me on, man. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. I always fun to see the differences between two parts of the world and see basically when we have this discussion that the differences aren't that big, or at least we have a little bit more privacy. But when we come to investigations, we can basically still do the same thing. We can find information, we can process information, and we can analyze information, but just stick to the rules. Yep, absolutely. All right. Well, I think that's about it for today. Um, I want to thank the audience. I want to thank you, Micah. And uh, I look forward to uh, the next talk that we may plan in the near future. Also, uh, there are some other resources being mentioned in the bar underneath here. So uh, take a look at that. And if you want to know more about us, feel free to reach out on the internet. Absolutely.